land that is healthy and strong and regenerated is going to produce food that makes our bodies healthy and strong and regenerated. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey guys, I'm your host, Total Abradagor. This is episode 196, and our guest today is John Arbuckle. John is a ninth generation livestock farmer with a focus on regenerating the land. He and his family live, farm, and market their farm products in coastal Maine. John told me that he is grateful for each day that he gets to wake up and hold hands with the earth. And that concept has captivated me and is highlighted in our conversation today. He invites us to join him in doing just that. This conversation makes us ponder what it means to live in such a way that revitalizes the earth. And you don't have to be a farmer to do this. We want to give a quick shout out before we get into the conversation to our sponsors. Vintage Tradition. Just in time for chapped sunburned lip season, Vintage Tradition has come out with four great flavors of their tallow balm that you know and love in a convenient tube. Citrus Shine, Peppermint Stick, Vanilla Bean, and totally unscented. Protect your lips naturally at VintageTradition.com. And for a limited time, get 10% off your entire order with coupon code PODCAST10. And Ancestral Supplements. Bovine tracheal cartilage with liver by Ancestral Supplements. Putting back in what the modern world has left out. New Zealand sourced nose-to-tail organ meats and bone marrow in convenient gelatin capsules. Our family can't get enough of these supplements. I personally love the liver. And all of it is based on the ancient wisdom of like supports like. Order yours today at ancestralsupplements.com. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, John. Thank you. How long have you been farming? Um, I grew up farming with my father and grandfather. So, uh... It, my earliest memories of farming is my father carrying me around. <laughs> um, so a long time. I took a, a 12-year sabbatical um, where I worked uh, guiding uh, adventure trips. Uh, most of them were rafting trips around the world. And eventually, I just decided to come back to farming. So 12-year 12, 12 hiatus in the middle, but all my childhood and all my adult life after that. Wow. Well, it just, to me as I was telling you before we started rolling, like farming never seemed like a career choice for me. Like it just seemed like the most distant foreign thing as if you said to me, Hilda, why don't you think about becoming an astronaut? I had no clue of its importance. Again, you were carried around on a farm as a child, but how did that sink into your heart? Well, you know, uh, my children are the 10th generation of my family to consecutively farm in America. And we have kind of uncounted generations before that in northern Germany and Scotland. So it's really all we've done. We, we haven't done anything but farm for, you know, more than 300 years now. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So that it's just, it's what my people do. My people grow plants and animals, and then we uh, provide them for other people's nourishment. So I feel that my family just has a very long tradition of holding hands with the earth in order to provide food for other people. And now you wouldn't do it, even if it was what your family has done for generations, if you didn't love it in some way, shape or form, right? Because you're just going strong and hard. What is it about it that brings you joy, John? Well, um, it's that idea of holding hands with the earth. You know, um, it's my job to get up every day and touch the earth. And in doing that, uh, most farms are actually degraded ecosystems, degraded environments. And uh, so my opportunity is to step onto a degraded piece of the earth, a a piece of land where humans and the earth have not held hands for some time or perhaps in a very distant way. And uh, as I see it, the more that I am in tune with, uh, you know, creation around me, the earth, nature, wild plants and animal species, 
uh, the human beings that make up my community. The more that I'm doing that, I'm restoring a very powerful uh, relationship. And as we restore that relationship, uh, nothing bad happens. Only good things happen when that relationship is restored. So, for example, we're able to sequester carbon in the soil. We're able to create food, which is much more nutrient dense. We're able to start to disassemble the very centralized food system that America currently has and recreate a more decentralized food system where consumers have greater transparency and can make decisions based on you know real data and real information that the giant companies may not be willing to offer. The animal welfare of the animals improves. Things like erosion start to go away. Wild species and conservation practices can thrive. You know, as that relationship, as that one single thing is nourished and strengthened, a hundred other things get better. That must be so gratifying. Very much so. And it's, it's not something that takes a thousand years. You know, it's not something that takes oceans of time to witness. You know, we moved onto our farm in where we live now in Maine eight months ago, and we got maybe four months of the grazing season in, and we use a very specific grazing format called holistic planned grazing that's advocated by the Savory Institute. And uh, we would rotationally graze cows, pigs, horses, and chickens uh, in a very special way. And I'm looking out my window right now, and I can see the line where the animals stopped offering their gift to the earth uh, in the fall, I can see where they have been and where they have not been. And where, you know, we moved them into a barn during a, during a blizzard. They, they weren't able to remain comfortable out on pasture through a main winter. But the line where they stopped is very distinct. It's beautiful lime green on the other side where they have been. And where they have not been is, uh, is very brown. You know, there's no bare land showing, no bare dirt showing. But the grass there is brown. It's uh, not photosynthesizing. Yeah, it's not being regenerated because animals are not part of that ecosystem. All ecosystems require animals. And where our animals have been, the land is better than when we got here eight months ago. Yeah, as you're speaking, in my mind's eye, I remember when I went to Zimbabwe to one of Alan Savory's holistic management hubs, and he was able to show me through photographs what the land looked like before they started letting the animals regenerate the soil, kind of harnessing the hooves, if you will, as his daughter puts it. The contrast is stark, and yet somehow I feel like Many of us are missing the big picture that we actually need animals to kind of hold hands with the land, as you say, for it to regenerate. Absolutely. I I can't imagine why we would ignore an important piece of an ecosystem, you know, especially when that piece of an ecosystem allows us to remove obstacles to holding hands with the land. You know, obstacles to holding hands with the land would include large volumes of petroleum, unuseful government intervention projects huge machinery, large, you know, debt, all of those things are impediments to holding hands with the land. Uh, So if, if we find ourselves in a place where we don't need to till the ground, we don't need to take other, you know, impediments, if we don't need to allow some of those impediments to work their way in, then we find ourselves on a prairie, you know, surrounded by plants and animals. And I enjoy that a lot. So earlier you were saying that you're restoring the soil in a way that fights the degradation that you often see firsthand early on when you come to a plot of land. Like, is that from those interventions you were talking about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so Gabe Brown is a regenerative farmer from North Dakota. One of my favorite quotes from Gabe is, if you want to change small things, change the way you do things. But if you want to make big changes, change the way you see things. And it takes a while for that concept to, to trickle in. But uh, previously, all of the farms that I've lived on have not been viewed as a living organism. Uh, they've been viewed as a substrate upon which animals stand or you stuff you know, corn seeds into 
they, they have not been viewed as a living entity. And um, as such, they have not been nurtured. And in not being nurtured, um, they have degraded. You know, nothing, nothing in nature is staying the same. It's either getting better or it's getting worse, but it's not static. So we all want to be a part of that healing equation. And so my question to you is, for those of us who are not farmers, how can we help in the restoration of the land? And actually, even backing up further, why should it matter to us what the status of the land is? So um, we've all seen large scale fires and droughts. Um, We've seen desertification happening. The deserts of the world are getting larger, not smaller. Uh, we've seen large scale flooding in the Midwest and then the Northeast and then, you know, various parts of the country. This is all not, you know, random coincidence. You know, this is as a result of our, our small water cycle being impaired and our soil not being able to infiltrate water. So uh, in a prairie ecosystem, we may have something very high, 8% organic matter in the soil very long roots going deep into the soil, a constant layer of armor across the surface, that land is able to accept rainfall. So if a six inch rainfall occurs, most of that water is gonna soak into the ground. If on the other hand, we have land that has not been viewed as a living organism and treated as such, if we have land that's been viewed as, you know, the equivalent of a parking lot, then it'll start responding in kind. You know, when six inches of rain falls on that, it's going to go tearing down the gullies, you know, dragging topsoil and over nutrification with it. It's in most instances, statistically speaking, we can guess that most of that will end up in the Mississippi River, which will then go into the Gulf of Mexico, where there is an enormous dead zone created by over nutrification. If the consumer doesn't feel like that affects them directly, then uh, we can look at the large scale flooding that's happened in the Midwest. You know, if soil had been treated as a living organism, it would be able to accept those rains without the enormous flooding that we're seeing. The same holds true for droughts and, uh, and fires, you know, the fires in California. Much of that could have been managed for by seeing the land uh, not as a parking lot or a substrate that we drive our cars on, but as a, just as a living thing. That, that's, why, that's why customers should care because it does affect all of us in a day-to-day sense. And you know, secondarily to that, we might say, or, or maybe not secondarily, land that is healthy and strong and regenerated is going to produce food that makes our bodies healthy and strong and regenerated. Right. Yeah, that's not secondarily at all, actually, if you think about it, because if we're egocentric, we're going to be like, okay, what's going to make me strongest? It's not just, you know, some artificially pumped up cereal with a lot of additional vitamins and minerals put in. And this is a parallel to what you were just saying. It's not just a cereal boosted with vitamins and minerals. It's something that's authentically grown with a nutrient dense content that's going to really build our bodies. And so Yeah, as you're talking, I keep thinking of food and and body parallels where we think, oh, I have a little scrape on my elbow. I guess I'll put a Band-Aid on it. When in actuality, it's not a scrape. It's just like huge gaping wound. And I think with some intervention, or as you were saying, that kind of adding those nutrients to the top of the soil, I'm going to fix it somehow. And that's not the case. You kind of need to dig deeper and look at it completely differently. Absolutely. I mean, just on the question of adding things to the soil, There are so few soils worldwide that don't have enough vitamins and minerals in them already. Just the trouble is, is that without some uh, mycorrhizal fungi and other soil microorganisms, much of that vitamin and mineral content, as we might describe it, uh, is not accessible to the plant. So it's just like a bunch of, what would we describe it? It's like a bunch of rocks in a bag. You know, like uh, the plant is not interacting with with those minerals. Uh-huh. Uh, another thing that's that's interesting, and just in terms of uh, soil, just things that people add to the soil. You know, fertilizer, for example. For every acre of ground, there's thirty two thousand pounds of atmospheric nitrogen floating above it. Right. If we can incorporate livestock and uh, legumes into our farming there's no reason to buy that nitrogen, you know, 32,000 pounds above every acre. You know, uh, if we can harness legumes and livestock, we can capture that 
uh, by way of crop rotations and livestock rotations. And we can get that nitrogen into our soil without writing a gigantic check. And fertilizer checks are astronomical these days, hundreds of thousands of dollars for big farms. And uh, we can simply stop holding hands with our banker and start holding hands with the earth. Yes, it reminds me of something Joel Salatin said. Here's a pig, you know, urinating and the manure, like these things fertilize the ground. And other farmers are going out and buying some artificial compounds that have ingredients that are harmful to the planet and to us. Yeah, absolutely. And much of the synthetic fertilizers contain a mild form of salt. So every time we apply a synthetic fertilizer, we're actually applying a small quantity of salt to our fields. And, you know, if we have done this for, you know, let's say 50 years, you know, since the onset of the Green Revolution, we can, we can start to have, uh, what should we say? We could start to have impaired soil function as a result of small quantities of salt there. Coming up, John compares and contrasts regenerative farming with permaculture and sustainable farming. I think all of those approaches are very closely related, so he helps us distinguish between them. And he also talks about why more farmers should consider themselves soil farmers at heart. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Hey, you guys, we want you to join us at our annual Wise Traditions Conference. It is the place to be to enjoy nutritious food, learn healing wisdom, meet friends, and be inspired. Learning healing wisdom is not just something that happens in the sessions when we're listening to the speakers. I'm telling you, I've gotten more over a conversation at lunch at this conference than I have at entire weekends on other health retreats. It is fantastic, and I guarantee you that you will walk away with some tangible bit of advice that is going to move the needle on your health. So please, yes, join us at this conference November 15th to the 17th, just north of Dallas, Texas. Go to wisetraditions.org to sign up today. The Wise Traditions Conference is where ancestral wisdom meets modern science. And ancestral supplements with bovine tracheal cartilage with liver. Ancestral Supplements offers New Zealand-sourced nose-to-tail organ meats, bone marrow, and bovine tracheal cartilage in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. The life's work of Dr. John F. Pruden showed that bovine tracheal cartilage had unique and powerful effects on wound healing, immune conditions, joint health, and other conditions considered to be treatment resistant to conventional therapies. All of these conditions were immune in nature with the exception of the wound healing studies. According to Dr. Pruden, bovine cartilage closely resembles fetal mesenchyme, the primordial tissue which muscle, bone, tendons, ligaments, skin, fat, and bone marrow, the heart of the immune system, all develop. Bovine tracheal cartilage provided concentrated amounts of connective tissue, immunoregulators, and cartilage building blocks that are now missing from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. So I want to pivot now and ask you a little bit about regenerative agriculture. That is a term we hear a lot of these days. What does it even mean, John? Regenerative agriculture is farming in nature's image in a way that restores organic matter to the soil and uh, increases the quantity and diversity of soil life, soil microorganisms. So that's the longer answer. The shorter answer basically, I would say, is farming in a way that sequesters carbon in the soil. And if we're doing that, our organic matter of our soil will be going up. The important thing to remember in regenerative is there is not a prescriptive best practices method that we that we dictate to farmers. Um, I don't think that that's the correct approach. I think that the correct approach should be that we ask farmers because farmers are think outside the box geniuses. They, they will figure out in their ecosystem with their financial goals, with their uh, limitations, whether it's labor or land or climate, they'll, they'll realize their unique context and they'll find a way uh, so long as they realize that they need to be 
monitoring that or record keeping that. So I think that the only way to gauge regenerative is an outcomes-based solution. We need to not be telling farmers how to farm, but just finding a way to let them know that it's valuable to see our organic matter rising and that that's not, it does, it's not going to take six generations to make that happen. We should see our organic matter rising in a five to 10 year window, you know, maybe even quicker than that. So again, this reminds me of a concept I've heard in wellness circles where they talk a lot about bio-individuality. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to tell you, you need to take desiccated liver unless I, mm -hmm. I know what's going on with you. Like your body's going to be different than mine and you may need less or more of that particular food than, than I do. So it's, it, that's kind of what I hear you saying in terms of the soil and also kind of a sense of self-discovery. Let the farmer figure out what's going to work best on their land. Yeah, absolutely. Just because they'll, they'll know the land like, like we don't, you know, like uh, nobody will be able to give a set of prescriptive practices to a farmer. I mean, for one, if you try that, the farmer will stop listening to you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, and secondarily, it will probably be flawed. It may be well-meaning, but flawed. You know, and that the farmer just needs to realize that it's not the method of getting to the end result is up to them. But what's important is that uh, we stop losing carbon from the soil and we start regenerating it. We start getting the carbon back into the soil. And however they want to do that, you know, that, that's up to them. You know, the, the farmer is the king or the queen of his or her land and... Uh, they just need to realize that getting carbon into the soil is possible in their lifetime and profitable. So I've also heard terms like, you know, sustainable farming, permaculture. How does regenerative agriculture compare to those terms? Yeah. In order for an abstract term to be discussed, there has to be a working definition. Uh, the more abstract the term is, the more... Um, you know, one person says the word sustainable and they're thinking everything good. You know, this is high animal welfare. This is organic. This is no-till. This is low soil erosion. This is local. And that's how one person's mind is translating the word sustainable. Another person may hear the word sustainable and think, oh, this is a watered down version of organic. This just means natural. So we can be using the same word but not having effective communication. So then just to just to bullet point those words, uh, sustainable doesn't really have a definition uh, that I'm aware of. I mean, I've heard a couple uh, kind of vaguely similar, like free of overly processed foods or free of synthetic fertilizer. You know, uh, same thing with the word natural. There's, there doesn't seem to be an agreed on definition. Organic does have an agreed on definition. And it's a great start, you know, uh, no GMOs, no synthetic fertilizer, no pesticide, no synthetic pesticide. And that's a great start, but um, it also is prescriptive and top down, you know. So um, some people will fall through the cracks. Um, it, can't be the only, it can't be the only tool in the toolbox in regenerating soil. Uh, on our farm, you know, we're 100% committed to never using herbicide, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, or GMOs. We are also, while we are committed to avoiding those practices, we um, are a little bit lukewarm on certifying organic just because of the bureaucracy involved. We feel like we can communicate to our customers our virtues without uh, someone else doing that for us at this point. But a woman named Emily Moose from A Greener World is working uh, to hopefully create a definition for regenerative because it's very possible that without a definition, regenerative would go the way of sustainable. You know, for about 10 years, sustainable was really a hot topic buzzword. But now, depending on who you talk to, it means everything or it means nothing. So it would be nice to have an outcomes based definition for the word regenerative. So people can say, okay, when I buy a project, a product that's labeled regenerative, I know that the soil is improving and here are the check marks for what's improving and why that's important to me. We, we should be able to, 
you know, as a farming community, communicate that in a paragraph somewhere. Right. Yeah, no, that would be a beautiful thing. And we've talked a lot in this conversation about the soil and sequestering carbon. And I heard one farmer say, you know, I really consider myself a soil farmer. And in a sense, that's what you're saying. The farmers are producing food for our consumption, but they're really keeping the soil alive for the benefit of all of us, right? Would you consider yourself a soil farmer, John? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and it, like we said earlier, that really is to everyone's benefit. The more farmers that consider themselves soil farmers, if their soil is improving, we're going to see less droughts, less floods, less fires, more nutrient-dense food more decentralized food systems, uh, and more profitable farmers. Well, I want to talk to you about that because I've heard that small farms are going bankrupt like daily, like they're just falling by the wayside. Why is that? I try to take uh, self-responsibility for the majority of my problems. (laughs) So when I look at that, I think to myself uh, two things. You know, one, farming is among the most challenging occupations because of the risks involved with high capital investments, thin profit margins, and uh, the vagaries of, you know, shifting weather patterns. You know, when you look at it that way, like who would want that deal? You know, that's a very challenging deal. And then we we add to that, that uh, farmers need to see themselves first and foremost as small business people. So if we were to uh, imagine that we were going to start a restaurant or we were going to start a grocery store or any sort of retail shop or online presence, you know, what sort of human relations skills would, would you have to have to start a restaurant? You know, what sort of bookkeeping and accounting skills, if not possessed by the individual starting it, their ability to mobilize a workforce that's able to do the jobs that they don't want to do? how much uh, business coaching have they received? One reason that farmers have a hard time is because they are not good business people and that hurts them. You know, we, we recognize fairly early on that we were not qualified to be small business people and um, we've received very generous support from a lot of organizations in the form of uh, business coaching classes. I, I believe that we've had over 450 business coaching sessions with various entities. What? Um, you, and your, you and your spouse? 450? In the span of five years, you oh know, we, we plan on success. And the only way to succeed is to prepare to be a business person. You know, um, all of this other stuff that we're talking about is very noble. The high animal welfare, farming the soil, taking responsibility for carbon sequestration. But uh, this is a harsh statement, but the world doesn't owe us anything. We have to figure out how to sell a product. And that's hard to do because I was hearing tell yesterday of a farmer who was trying to sell his organic, you know, non-GMO, non-vegetarian feed, (laughs) all this stuff, all these eggs by the roadside and a stand for like $5 a pop. And yet everybody was going over to the Walmart where they could get them for $2 a dozen. Do you see what I mean? So there's this, I guess they do need the business classes because people are marching over to the better deal in their eyes and it's hurting farmers. Yeah. And, you know, we will never be price competitive with the giant entities. And I don't think we should try. But this is a little bit of a tangent to what I was was talking about a moment ago. But just um, in terms of, uh, you know, we sell value, you know, not economy. Some people in the world like a nice car. You know, every, maybe everybody does, you know, but some people are willing to take action based on that thought. So what farmers need to do is find a way of connecting with the audience, with their target audience, and then finding an efficient way to distribute to that target audience. Uh, and they are, there's lots and lots of ideas out there for that. I, I won't get into all those different strategies right now, but those strategies exist. And uh, what we have to do is put our product in front of the consumer in a form that will allow it to be easy. You know, not everybody wants to drive 30 minutes out of their way to buy 
a couple of chickens and a couple of tomatoes. You know what I mean? There's that there, there's only a few people, you know, in every county that are willing to do that. You know, there just aren't enough people that we can support the renaissance of American agriculture through that medium alone. You know, we need to uh, be putting food on grocery store shelves, on e-commerce sites, in buying clubs. But there are thousands of these across the country. Farmers just need to, I mean, nobody cares what the hard part is. That's going to be present in any job. We have to find a way around that obstacle. We have to successfully find a way to overcome that obstacle and, and do it in a way that regenerates us. Because, you know, like I said earlier, whatever noble thing we're doing, we don't, we don't get paid for being noble. You know, we don't get paid for being uh, sustainable or green or any of those things. We get paid by taking a product, which is all of those things, and then finding the way around the barrier to the customer. That's what we get paid for. There's a lot of wonderful people in the world who are not getting paid for being wonderful people. And uh, farmers just need to kind of swallow that jagged pill and realize, you know, when, uh, when they find the way around the obstacle, when they find a way to raise a product in a cost-effective way, market it, advertise it to their customer, and then figure out how to distribute it, they're going to get paid then. Yes. I like what you're saying about getting around that obstacle because I'm thinking there are people out there who are eager to get those farm fresh eggs, who want the soil to be regenerated, who want to honor the nobility of the farmer. But there are also people who are very busy and who are working all the time and who need to find a way to access that easily and affordably. So, yeah. so that's a good word to the farmer who's maybe getting discouraged right now or, or maybe on the brink of having to shut down his farm. Like there are business classes out there. There are things offered to them so that they can find their customers. So thank you for that, John. Now I want to ask you the question I often pose at the end with a little twist. I'm going to ask you if the listener could do one thing to help regenerate the soil, what would you recommend that they do? They should search out those farmers that they feel are regenerative, farmers that um, are really good at production, but less good at the skills that I was just kind of like, you know, dipping into a minute ago. And uh, if the customers want to try to find those farmers and then, you know, social media is a big thing. If, uh, if customers find a farmer that they really like, you know, is doing a really good job, just do whatever we can to get the word out to, to assist them you know, via social media or many, many methods, you know, but that's, yep. that's one thing. Um, in, in all of this, you know, regenerative agriculture starts with two things. You know, one is a regenerative deal, meaning that the farmer is actually making enough money to feel satisfied. And secondly, that all the people involved are regenerating also, because like you said earlier, you know, the modern lifestyle is very busy you know, the modern lifestyle is a very kind of, shall we describe it as hectic and indoor lifestyle. And as we're regenerating the land, you know, we, it's nice to value that. But um, what we need to also recognize is uh, if we're not regenerating ourselves, you know, we're, we're not doing the world any favors. And in that, you know, I mean, I know everybody's busy, but just recognizing that one of the hallmarks of having a human heart is requiring leisure and downtime. If we uh, are to, you know, I think about it like breathing, you know, uh, when we breathe out, that's our expression. That's what we put into the world. When we breathe in, we receive our inspiration. And uh, what I see a lot of is just a whole lot of out breaths, people putting energy into the world without nourishing themselves. And you know, whatever we're doing, you know, to the land around us, we're probably doing to our psyches as well. So it's just an encouragement for farmers to allow themselves to regenerate their hearts, you know, their spirits, for customers to do the same thing, for farmers to realize that they need to ask a regenerative price for their products. And, you know, it's, uh, it's not easy to connect, you know, with their customers. It's not easy to raise their farm to a economy of scale where farmers can have things like vacations, 
college funds for their kid, retirement accounts, pay for their land. That's really what we need. We need farmers to to be regenerated in a way that that creates, you know, middle class farmers. Uh, you know, we we don't need another hundred thousand poverty stricken, struggling farmers out there. We we need everyone in the picture to be regenerated as a result. Well, I like that phrase for all of us that we would all be regenerative people in and of ourselves, inhaling and exhaling, not simply exhaling. So thank you for that word and for your time today, John. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Hilda. I appreciate you asking such beautiful questions. My pleasure. Our guest today was John Arbuckle. Visit his website at singingprairiefarms.com. You can find me on Instagram at Holistic Hilda. And for the show notes for this and every episode of the Wise Traditions podcast, just go to our website, westonaprice.org. And that's it. Thanks, everybody, and see you next time. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care.